The odds may be against us, but I'll tell you this for free. Here it comes. This ends here and now! Oh! It took some time and tweaking, but at this point in his journey, I don't think it's much of a stretch to call Thor Odin's son one of, if not the, most dramatically compelling characters left standing in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. This feels born out of necessity. A nearly invincible Asgardian isn't the easiest hero to fret for when the battle heats up, and so since his very first appearance, Marvel Studios has taken care to face Thor with grounded emotional stakes even as half the world disintegrates around him. Even through Thor's less loved appearances, questions of living up to our family's expectations, maturity, duty, purpose, and yes, love, have always been at the fore for Thor, and remain at the fore for Thor 4. He's been part of saving the universe for a long time now, and Thor Love and Thunder has no illusions about needing to push the character in a new direction. And that's fine. Love and Thunder succeeds in honoring his journey, even if it doesn't offer much new for the MCU at large. Through a Korg narrated recap of Thor's history, we're reminded of how much tragedy and loss he's had to face, and how his current gig as a freelancing guardian of the galaxy is helping him along in his healing process. So at the time that Thor, the ragtag motley crew, misfit desperados, turned the tide in the battle and etched their names in history. Since director Taika Waititi's humanizing first turn with the character in Ragnarok, Chris Hemsworth has felt fearless in portraying both the god's internal turmoil and his bombastic personality, continuing to nail punchlines and physical comedy alike. With Thor at a crossroads, Love and Thunder wastes no time in reuniting him with Dr. Jane Foster, his former flame, and revealing something that should have seemed obvious from the start. It's a romantic comedy, and a good one at that. By fully embracing that genre's tropes, Waititi sets the stage for Hemsworth and Portman to seriously dial up their chemistry. We saw Jane do the fish out of water bit in the Dark World, but here Mjolnir has deemed her worthy and transformed her into the mighty Thor. Portman's foster never got her due in her initial appearances, and Waititi spends an appreciable amount of time making up for that by celebrating her intellect and bravery. Portman thrives on Jane's arc here, as she reckons with what the power of Thor means for her future. Though Jane's overeagerness to come up with a catchphrase veers too hard into the MCU's brand of self-referentiality. Oh God, will die. Gore the God Butcher, both haunted and haunting, vacillates between theatrical mustache twirling and unnerving resolve, and Bale treats every shade of the villain with verve. His quest, the conflict that drives Love and Thunder, is where the movie plays it safe with overly familiar beats as heroes and villains chase each other across the cosmos. While the film is snappily paced, no problem that Thor and Co. is saddled with sticks for long. This becomes especially noticeable in the fallout of the subplot involving Zeus as he and his truly crazy Greek, maybe, accent make their debut. Love and Thunder unfortunately underutilizes Tessa Thompson's King Valkyrie, who continues to rule in all senses of the word. The back half of the movie, however, completely fumbles this character. How King Valkyrie factors in feels designed to keep the story charging ahead at pace, in favor of whatever will move us along to the next battle the quickest. Those action scenes start to blur together towards the middle half. Gore's shadowy minions sometimes hurt the readability of the blocking, but that doesn't mean the director and Korg actor Taika Waititi isn't coloring his movie with every color of the rainbow at every chance he gets. Waititi has a top-shelf knack for finding comedic beats in odd and unexpected corners of his films, perhaps best displayed here in how both Mjolnir and Stormbreaker are anthropomorphized not only for laughs, but as a marker for Thor's emotional throughline. The soundtrack's needle drops, on the other hand, do become a little repetitive, both in how expected they become as the heroes march into battle and in artist curation. Love and Thunder features four songs from one album, and as classic as that album may be, there's little serious connection between those songs and the story, so it's a bit of a perplexing choice. And flick! Oh, you flick too hard, damn it! Thor Love and Thunder is largely successful in honoring Thor's long journey towards self-actualization and rarely falters while keying into the crackling chemistry between leads Chris Hemsworth, Natalie Portman, and Tessa Thompson. 
It's essentially the MCU's first romantic comedy and plays with those tropes in delightful ways. But while Thor and Jane's relationship is handled well, Love and Thunder is less deft and a lot safer than you would expect in pushing the greater MCU story forward. Christian Bale's gore feels underutilized, and Tessa Thompson's King Valkyrie takes a frustrating backseat, especially as the movie goes on. Taika Waititi's signature humor and visual style carry over from Ragnarok, and both are essential to buoying the movie through its cookie-cutter plot. With Hemsworth as enthusiastic an Asgardian as ever, Thor's future with both love and thunder are bright. For more on Thor Love and Thunder, check out our interviews with the cast, and after you see the movie, dive into spoilers galore in our Cannon Fodder episode. And as always, be sure to follow and subscribe wherever you like to watch IGN. This is the best day of my life! The Guardians. Uh, uh, giant uh, and giant goats! Oh, look at those! They are wonderful! Yes, they are. They also scream quite a lot. Ah!